room, we will get started momentarily. Good morning and welcome to those of you joining us on Zoom. If you just give us another moment for people to load into the Zoom room, we will get started momentarily. Hello and welcome to WIDA. Before we get to today's event, we have some big news. Later today, we plan to formally announce our 2023 Washington International Trade Conference. That'll be a hybrid event taking place on February 13th and 14th. For those of you joining us from across the US and around the world, all of the programming will be available online via Zoom. And if you're local in Washington, D.C., or have the ability to travel here, you can watch the first day of the conference online and then join us in person for the final half day of events. The WIDA Academy is also holding several special events later this month, one with African Trade Ministries and another with students at the University of Nebraska. Watch your inbox or go to our website, www.wita.org, for more information on all of these initiatives. As you know, if you've watched any of our past webinars, we like to call out the names of some of those you are in community with on Zoom, even if you can't see them on screen today. So welcome to Virginia Gum at the Aluminum Association, Jordan Stone at the Association of American Railroads, Professor Jerry Haar at Florida International University, and Carolina, Carolina Castellani at the Embassy of Brazil. Welcome Virginia, Jordan, Jerry, Carolina, and welcome to all of you. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can ask questions of our panel using the Q&A tab on Zoom. You should have also received a copy of today's event program and biographies of our speakers by email so we can dispense with lengthy introductions. Today's event is the culmination of a series of events this fall looking at the impact of three big legislative initiatives of the past year in the United States, dealing with infrastructure, industrial policies, and climate change. This event is also part of our Trade and Environment Series, sponsored by Silverado Policy Accelerator. With their support, we're able to make this event and all the events in our Trade and Environment Series free to attend on Zoom, and we're grateful to them for their commitment to WIDA's trade education mission. We're pleased to welcome two new faces to your WIDA screen. Sophie Beckham, the Chief Sustainability Officer at International Paper. She's coming to us today from Hood River in Oregon. And Ryan Fitzpatrick, director, of, not the football player, by the way, director of the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. Welcome to both of you. We're also pleased to welcome back to the WIDA stage, Vanessa Ciara, Vice President, Trade and International Competitiveness at the American Clean Power Association. A lot of you know her from her time at the National Foreign Trade Council and at the Commerce Department before that. Welcome, Vanessa. And of course, welcome to our moderator for today's discussion, Maureen Hinman, co-founder and chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, another former U.S. government official at the, at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. As I mentioned before, Silverado is a great friend and supporter of WIDA and many of you in the trade community, and we're delighted you could join us today. Maureen? Thanks so much, Ken, and good morning, everyone. Well, the day after the election here in Washington, uh, Folks are usually doing one of two things, either nursing a celebratory hangover or crying into our coffee cups. Um, so we're very grateful for the number of folks who joined us here online. Um, today, we expect a lively conversation about the next chapter in recent public investments in the US transition to a clean economy and what that might mean for US businesses and our trade partners. As we speak, world leaders are convening in Sharm el Sheikh for the 27th Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The passing of the Inflation Reduction Act this past year signifies a major down payment for a clean US economy that climate negotiators are likely to take to the bank this week in Egypt. The Rhodian Group has estimated that the climate impact of the IRA will equal an additional, an additional seven to 9% reduction in GHG emissions to put that will put the US within 10 percentage points of reaching its 2030 emissions target of 50% below 2005 levels. Um, the private sector is also taking the IRA to the bank and banking on the IRA's ability to stimulate green growth in the United States with investments in industrial decarbonization, household and building upgrades, and clean energy. 
The Blue-Green Alliance estimates that the economic impact of the IRA's climate provisions alone would include an additional 900,000 jobs in a combined public and, and, and combined public and private investments of 98 billion annually over a 10-year period. Now, those top line numbers always sound great, but I'd like to turn the floor to Sophie to kick off the discussion today. Sophie, for an emissions intensive and difficult to decarbonize industry like paper making, what does this mean for your ability to decarbonize? Great, thank you, Maureen. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to join the other panelists today and also thanks very much for the question. I do think this is sort of an interesting moment to have this discussion as you reference the COP and also um, the, the elections here in the US yesterday. Um, I would say that regardless of what's going on in the national or international policy, seen, it's really important to state up front that for international paper, our entire business model is really developed to drive sustainable outcomes. Um, as a large packaging and, and pulp producer, our efforts to decarbonize have been uh, sort of historical and long lasting and are those that we are going to continue to take into the future. Um, and I would take, point to a couple of key examples there, and then also want to speak to your question directly. So about 70% of the energy we use today in our, in our mills and facilities is derived from carbon neutral biomass residuals, and the remainder of that is from purchased energy. Um, and, and so I think we have uh, an opportunity within that sort of purchased energy component to think about, well, where can we make improvements when it comes to fuel switching or otherwise to improve our climate impact across the board. I also think we have a great opportunity with, with some of the policy mechanisms that you mentioned to really look to how can innovation and new technology help scale up some of our decarbonization efforts. And I think that's where we're really looking to, um, to sort of be partners in this. Uh, we're working with the US Department of Energy and the Better Climate Challenge to really drive some of this um, scaled up action that can sort of help our industry and others as we move towards a low carbon future. I think that, um, we have some, some potential, we're very optimistic. We wanna to look to, uh, to work with the DOE and others as we move forward here in the US. And I think just kind of coming back to that COP27 uh, comment, I think we're also looking to sort of see how some of the global policies around land use, around implementation of really good anti-deforestation uh, policy, how that can really help to, to level set, create, um, sort of a global condition in which we're thinking of forests and land as natural climate solutions and connecting with other key topics like biodiversity, which are really kind of core to our own value chain and business model. Thanks so much, Sophie. And that 70% number is very impressive. So hopefully you can get all the way to 100% in the next couple of years. Um, so uh, now just turning to, to Ryan next, I'd like to comment that, you know, many have said that this feels different uh, and notwithstanding the enthusiasm for climate provisions, uh, what's actually different about this tie? This time, what does the IRA have to offer that better addresses a pathway to decarbonization that's realistic for a country as large and geographically diverse as the United States, Ryan? That is a great question. And it's, one of these things where we have a lot to be excited about. And I think most people are used to being um, uh, thinking about climate as a deficit that we have to work off, something that is hanging over our heads. And we don't often get a chance to talk about how many amazing tools we have that were just delivered through IRA, but also the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that are gonna help us do this and also create a lot of opportunities for economic development, job creation in the US and abroad. I would say a couple of things here. One of the most important, and this is, this is important for the US, but also internationally, is that we're putting billions of dollars. So just for demonstration projects alone, roughly $25 billion toward uh, uh, emerging technologies, making sure that we can prove their commercial viability. Uh, and this is something that we've done in the past that has helped jumpstart entire industries. These are tools that we know work. We know they work at the lab scale or the bench scale, um, and then maybe in pilots or smaller operations. But if we're talking about things like carbon capture, um, small modular reactors, um, and then uh, in some cases, putting a lot of these pieces together with um, uh, hydrogen production and carbon capture, or using new um, electrolyzer technology to create low carbon hydrogen. Um, these are things that the United States now has real dollars behind. And 
So that helps us achieve our goals, but it's also going to put technologies in commercial markets uh, going forward. I'd also note financing opportunities are massive in this, uh, in this package, especially in IRA. The US has a really um, uh, helpful tool or set of tools, the loan programs office. And uh, as we saw, we didn't actually, uh, the United States wasn't really able to deploy commercially at scale um, in a lot of areas like solar and wind that are now um, very commonplace that are financed by private markets. Um, we didn't do that until there was some breakthrough in um, federally backed loans that took on some of that risk that came through the stimulus during the Obama administration. Now we've turbocharged those LPO programs. Again, billions of dollars. We're talking about $400, $450 billion in uh, added loan authority for some technologically um, advanced um, or innovative uh, technologies, but also for manufacturing um, and for a, a wide variety of transportation and, uh, and industrial sector um, advancements. So projects that would likely not get financing otherwise are going to now. Great, thanks so much. Uh, and next to De Vanessa, speaking of incentives, um, I'd like to finish off remarks with you. Uh, a big, bold question, is it enough? What are the missing pieces of the puzzle that will get the United States the rest of the way? Right, well, um, there's always missing pieces because nothing's perfect. Um, I will say at the outset that the IRA is transformative. Um, my, 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 our CEO, uh, the, our first CEO recently announced that she's leaving, but um, Heather Zeichel, who I think is terrific, said, you know, she, she, that was the word she kept using, transformative. Um, I think this is an amazing uh, piece of legislation. And I will say that the best thing about it, and I've learned this by working with these, these industry members for, for a year and a half now, is that the scale and technology that's needed to do the kind of massive investments we, we need will take time. And, and the most wonderful thing about this legislation is its time frame. So historically clean power industries have lived on these sort of series of one to two year extensions and sort of hoping that they would be a little longer. And the, and the, and the, the thing about this law that's truly amazing, it's, it's a decade of incentives. Over time, there are requirements for industry to comply with certain types of enhancements, domestic content, that kind of thing over time, it does ramp up, but it gives us a time frame that's really bankable, looking at the financing opportunities and looking at how long it takes to bring some of this manufacturing capacity online, because this is pretty complicated stuff. Um, building um, storage batteries and solar panels and wind turbines is not something that's that stood up in a few months. Um, and so we need that, that time frame, that sort of, that time frame is really helpful. But um, big missing piece from my perspective, I'm a trade person, not an energy person by, by heritage. Um, we've got this sort of complicated relationship between climate and trade. So we just released our Q3 uh, 2022 report on all of our technologies, wind, solar, and battery. And the, the, the really devastating news was for solar. And this is because at the utility uh, scale project level, which was where I work, solar deployments are down. And that is because of mainly a host of trade challenges that we've been facing that has limited access to panels. And the panels are critical to deploying the clean energy solutions and solar. Um, so I think the takeaway from that, I would say, is we need to consider from a whole of government perspective, how defensive our trade positions should be and how ambitious our climate deployment goals uh, like IRA are, and then how do we make those work together better? And when we take strong defensive trade positions, we need to understand that that has a trade-off. Um, and just to sort of give you the most obvious example, I would say 301 tariffs are a good example. So 301 tariffs affect all of my technologies um, in different ways. But you know, the question we have to ask ourselves as, as, as we work with the Biden administration to look at the future, the next you know, few years of, 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 of the Biden administration's approach to China is how do the 301's tariff play into that? Are they more beneficial? Are they a drag on deployment? Where are we as a government and as a society going to decide we want to place those markers? And I think that's a good example of that tension. Excellent point. And, and as of those of us who are, I'm also from a trade extraction and, uh, you know, an energy, uh, energy by love, but um, we certainly, there's always a trade-off for every policy and we have to think about what our, 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 our core objectives are. So transitioning to the, the broader discussion, I'm just gonna throw a question out to, to the group. Uh, we've laid out a really compelling picture here. Uh, and, but in order to, to, to grow green, we have to really take into account global supply chains, um, both for what we need and want to produce at home, 
and what we need uh, and expect other countries to invest in in their own decarbonization pathways. Uh, therefore, what does a complementary trade policy look like um, that effectively takes into account both, as Vanessa was mentioning, our offensive interests, including market access? Uh, I know that's kind of become a dirty word in Washington, but I think we have to think about it. And, and second, our defensive interests with regard to what we want to protect in terms of a, the, a clean transition that, that makes sense uh, with respect to our, our values. Maureen, I could jump in um, on that one. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to kind of tie into Vanessa's uh, comments and say that I think all of the technologies that you referenced are critical. We, we sort of need to leverage all of the tools right now on this decarbonization journey. And so in whatever way we can to advance those, whether it's solar or wind or battery storage. And I think there's really an important one that we in our industry think about all the time, which is sort of what is that natural climate solution. And, and it's a little um, less sexy because the technology has literally been around for millennia and it's called photosynthesis. And as long as the sun shines and the rain falls and the trees grow, um, forests and trees and ecosystems have this natural ability to sequester carbon. And so I think that is yet another really important lever um, and another tool in our toolbox as we also think about further into our value chain in our manufacturing space, really being able to tie into some of those renewable energy opportunities and encourage kind of not just innovation and scaling up, but also the trade policy that would allow those um, to really take hold and be successful. Um, you asked about what does a complementary trade policy look like? And I think in our world, we really think about the USMCA, which was historic for our industry um, in committing the US, Canada, and Mexico to combating illegal logging and associated trade. And I think that that um, particular agreement included strong support for sustainable forest management and, and also notes that forest products, which is this world we live in that people don't think about as much because when that Amazon box gets delivered on your front door, you're really way more excited about, um, you know, whatever is in the box than the box itself. But that, that packaging kind of makes global trade happen. Um, and I think that those renewable kind of fiber-based products when sourced from sustainably managed forests kind of contribute to these global environmental solutions. And so I think that particular agreement really set the standard both for, um, for the environment and industry to win. Um, and I think it also, uh, that kind of meaningful trade agreement includes um, market access and also enforcement. And so I think just as a final kind of note on that, um, in 2008, the U.S. passed the Lacey Act, uh, which really set uh, the standard on, on trade of, um, of forest products and combating deforestation. And Representative Blumenauer is a trade champion, led this effort. Um, and here we are in 2022, and this bill has yet to be kind of fully implemented. And I think it was foundational at the time. There was tremendous energy around it, um, and yet we're really not seeing it come to its, its full fruition. So I think that there are efforts to, to drive that forward. Um, and I think that we wanna continue to, um, to see that come to um, its full potential and, and actually uh, be able to see it, it realize um, the opportunity that it has to really set the standard uh, for, for an effective trade policy. Great points. Does anyone else wanna weigh in on their wish list? Well, I'll jump in. I'm sure Ryan has something. <laughs> um, so I would say um, more work on uniform standards and definitions and sort of what are we talking about? I, I, I've worked with businesses almost my entire career, and I, I know that they crave some sort of common standards. It's really, really hard when you see different countries developing different standards, different definitions, different ideas of how they want to regulate, because the first thing business people think is, oh crap, now I'm going to have to have compliance programs that cover those different countries. And if those are common markets for me, I, that just made my cost of doing business go up. So I, I mean, just a general concept here, but I think that's something we really need to think about how we're going to, how, how we're going to do. And I know Ryan probably has some thoughts on that too. Uh, you read my mind. Yes. Um, completely agree with Vanessa on this. And I, I can give a couple of examples. So third way work with Breakthrough Energy um, and commissions uh, some major analysis from, from Boston Consulting Group that we released last September, we did was look at six clean energy technologies and break them down into their value chain segments so that we could see where does the US have a competitive advantage or the potential to build a durable competitive advantage, uh, knowing that not all value chain segments would be you know, bullseyes for the United States. And that's important to know. One thing that we did find in one of the technologies, which was direct air capture, was that the US does have some opportunities in 
uh, in OEM, let's say, but the biggest opportunity is in offtake. So the US would have access to a $1 trillion global market for offtake, whether that's credits, it's gonna be predominantly credits probably, or you know, uh, the use of some CO2, a trillion dollars between now and 2050. Um, and some of the largest markets for that are gonna be in Europe. In order to access that market though, we're gonna to need to make sure that our credits are accepted by those markets. So harmonizing, however you wanna define that, uh, harmonizing our uh, MRV or our ability to, uh, the way in which we are, are uh, measuring and reporting on some of these credits has to work with those markets in order for this to make financial sense for us. So it does, it's kind of that like self-interest, but also cooperation effort. And, and there are different ways that you can do this, right? There's a, there's a, there are processes through the UNF triple C um, focused on climate for those of you that are not as familiar, but a uh, UN entity focused on climate that runs the COPS. Um, and, uh, you know, they have a, a red process that I would say is probably pretty cumbersome um, in trying to harmonize some of uh, these efforts. So there is a good opportunity, in my opinion, for multilateral, probably most likely bilateral uh, engagement agreements um, that can set these types of standards. Um, EU Commission has already proposed uh, a carbon removal certification framework. So the US can propose its own framework that aligns or try to work in cooperation with the EU to see if they can uh, agree on something that is interchangeable. But the dollars and cents are there. It, there's a reason why we should do it and not just on, on principle. There is a self-interested motive for trying to coordinate on this as well. Great point. And I really liked what you had to say about uh, value chain segments. Uh, one of the reasons that we trade, and for those of us who have to, who have to harken back to our graduate school and uh, trade economics class, it's really about specialization. No one country is going to do everything well, and we actually are best when we are all playing our strengths, but also thinking strategically about what our strengths are. So to that, I wanted to uh, turn the next question to what we received an audience question, which uh, is, how to build sustainability uh, into the development of new technologies, i.e. Environmental, environmental effect of mining and critical minerals. What does, what does that look like and what does that look like in the trade context? Uh, I can take a, a shot at that. Um, I think that uh, maybe hearkening back to some of Vanessa's comments um, uh, and actually uh, also, you know, this is, this is something that we've all been speaking on, Sophie, as well, um, is forms of measuring and understanding impacts, uh, and they need to be agreed upon. I don't think everyone's going to agree that, that any metric is perfect, but we have to know what we're measuring and what we're looking for. Um, and that isn't actually quite all that common, um, uh, even in having one uniform uh, metric within North America. I think what we need to do in terms of uh, minerals, there, there's the need for more granular data, the use of things like environment, environmental product declarations, which are uh, tools that can help you report on um, your uh, emissions, uh, and they can be carbon emissions, they can be all types of societal or uh, environmental impacts. And these are forms that, that can be um, uh, made cohesive and uniform. They are already used by dozens of countries or in dozens of countries um, by the private sector. Um, but this is a really good tool that we need to be able to strengthen um, in order to set those types of standards. And again, if markets are demanding a certain level and we can agree there's uniformity on how we determine that, how we measure it, how we report on it, that's the initial indicator. And we will see first movers in industry taking strides on that. And right now we just don't have that level of granular data or the uh, uh, fully agreed upon uh, methods for, for using that. I would point out, going back to your question earlier, Maureen, that in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's $250 million to help industries complete environmental product declarations. So taking some of that burden or the onus um, off of the private sector and making sure that um, including, you know, small and medium size uh, manufacturers or businesses are able to, uh, to complete these that are eventually going to help some of these companies, these industries access markets that are moving forward um, on emissions or other sustainability initiatives. Great points, Ryan. Um, so what I'm getting a sense of here is that uh, as we move forward, we're still in a process of data discovery and we're still in a process of price discovery. 
which means that if you're going to make good policy, you have to know where your blind spots are and where those data gaps are. So I, I'm wondering if anyone from the panel wanted to, wanted to jump in on, on where they believe we have uh, existing blind spots with our with our strategy. I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, and it's I'm going to jump out from sort of Ryan's at the data level. I'm at the consensus building level. Um, I would say we need government solutions that allow for more consensus building and more stakeholder engagement. I, I'm My background is USTR and trade, um, and I love process and I love stakeholder engagement. And I think, um, you know, historically USTR as an agency has done really well at that. So kudos to the agency. Um, but I think we need more of that, more robustly developed. And this is tough because climate energy trade, they cross over multiple jurisdictional boundaries. So we've got multiple agencies in the, in, even in this administration, we've got multiple agencies that feel that they're sort of in, in some way or other driving or should be driving. Um, certainly DOE, USTR, Commerce, to some extent Treasury, because IRA has a big Treasury piece. Um, and the idea that, you know, th that we need cohesion and consensus building that crosses the agencies is something that I'm trying to press with my USG contacts. But that would be my number one sort of process ask is that we think more whole of government, consensus building, build in stakeholder engagement in a way that's robust across these multiple agencies and that we coordinate because, you know, we, all those of us who work in government know it's a great frustration when you see a different an agency working, sort of either doing the same thing you're trying to do, working at cross purposes, and you, you know, you hopefully have an interagency convener that you can pull people together, but that's really a critical piece of this. And I think that needs some, some, some more buildup. Yeah, maybe I can, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead, Ryan. I was that's just going to say, I, I, um, I think maybe I can, Maybe I can bridge the, the gap between Ryan's focus on data and, and Vanessa, your, your comment about consensus building. I think being in the in sort of the middle of that, I think we also need to encourage transparency and disclosure. And I think ultimately it's not just about sort of consensus building and harmonization of the frameworks that we might report to, uh, but it's also about collaboration with those who are the implementers. And as, a, as an implementer, as an implementing company for a lot of these, it's got to be workable for us. And it's got to be something that we can actually practically say yes, to Ryan's point, we can we can get the data on whatever it is that we're trying to measure. Yes, we can uh, transparently disclose it. Um, yes, there's a level playing field for that. And also we can kind of collaborate on an, an input to some of those frameworks um, that Vanessa you're speaking of in terms of building consensus in terms of the expectation. Um, and I think that uh, there is a mo we're in a moment in time right now where we're going from like a like a framework soup, you know, some sort of like constellation of of different kind of reporting opportunities to, to one in which we might see more harmonization. And I think that ultimately, provided those are, are workable solutions, that's going to lead to that sort of increased uh, generation of, of data, the disclosure piece, and then ultimately be able to create something that um, at the hopefully at the kind of global level we can use. Uh, to be able to be speaking the same language with our trade partners. Great point, and I, I love the I love the term framework soup. Anyone who's worked in the U.S. government is certainly familiar with the concept, but I think he did a great job of naming it. But we all know intuitively. Um, so, in terms of that framework soup, I have a question to, to the group. Uh, first of all, do we need a Chips Act for for clean technology? And second, uh, in terms of that hierarchy, uh, who goes on? Who's in first? Uh, what's your wish list? So I'm jealous <laughs> of the chips people, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, I would love, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, be careful what you wish for, I guess, but yeah, watching the chips exercise has been pretty, um, it's been pretty awesome, honestly. I think um, those of us who have done government work for a long time are, are, are impressed that um, at the way that it's been driven and kudos to Commerce uh, for, and the White House for doing such a great job. I think um, it's pretty impressive. And I think our trading partners have noticed it's impressive. That creates some tensions of its own, but you know, some of this is gonna be a balancing act. But yeah, I think uh, we, we are, on my, in, in my world, we're trying to figure out like, is that something we want? And if we want it, how would it be structured? Because certainly it's an impressive template. I think there's something to be said for uh, for taking a long term view, um, and you know, again, Inflation Reduction Act does a lot of investing, and in some cases it's technology specific, but in a lot of cases it's technology inclusive. So seeing what is uh, you know most uh, desired by the market, um, but having a strategic plan for um, an industry and going multiple years 
is um, hard to it's hard to substitute for that um, because you know we we've seen especially if these are um, uh, industries or commodities that um, have sensitivities around national security around um, you know uh, being uh, frameworks or foundations for entire other industries um, that we do want to make sure we are maintaining um, operations and being very strategic and decisive within the context of those sole industries or commodities. So that long-term planning process, identifying supply chain gaps, those are the types of things that um, would be really helpful to have a concerted effort for. I think it becomes really hard to have, um, you know, 15 or, or more parallel efforts running um, for different uh, technologies or, or tools. But it gets at the larger approach, which is it's not a bad thing to have a strategic plan, whether you want to call it industrial policy or not, um, having a strategy is important. Our competitors are doing that, um, and we would expect them to. The alternative is throwing things at a throwing darts at a dartboard, um, and I, I don't think that that is good government, um, and I don't think that's going to yield strong results for us or for our trading partners. Well, I certainly agree with you, but uh, industrial policy used to be a dirty word in Washington, and I'm glad that you raised it. Question to the group, is it still? I'll take that. Uh, I would say get over it, <laughs> because I think whether you like it or not, that's kind of how we're going to, uh, on the clean energy side, certainly we're, we're in that world um, for the rest of my career, certainly. Um, I think, you know, uh, look, CHIPS, IRA, their, their, their bones of these things are in what we used to call in the old days in grad school, Maureen, industrial policy. Um, and I think, you know, uh, those of us who've, who've been watching this will say that this is all um, industrial policy for the better of, of, of most Americans. I mean, we're trying to build some national security independent strengths in our supply chains. We're also going to have to realize we have, we have trading partners who may take umbrage at some of the things that we're doing, but it's, it's, it's all in the service of building something very robust. I think that Biden administration deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, but the challenging issues are, I'm going to put on the table. I mean, how do you balance industrial policy goals with post-World War II rules on trade that have served the world incredibly well for 75 years? And that is the challenge, right? I mean, um, if you're going to jettison some of the rules, for example, I think you need to carefully assess the consequences of those choices and, and, and not be doing it in a cavalier way, but in a thoughtful way. Um, it's just, it's a, th those are tough balancing decisions to make and they need to be really thoughtful and carefully articulated. Great. And I have several questions here uh, asking about the role of the WTO and Q. So uh, you, you probably, um, uh, you know, you had your spidey, spe spidey sense going up about that. So I guess the question is, is there a, is there a collaborative role in the WTO or with WTO partners as we move forward in a new economy? understanding that the rules that may have served us, served us in the past maybe don't serve us in this, in this new era. Ryan looks like he wants to say something. <laughs> no, I was going to go back on mute because this is definitely <laughs> Vanessa territory. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. That's a, that's a tough one. I'm like, I, I, I will, I'm going to, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to show my colors. I think the WTO is an incredible institution um, and, you know, I, I know people that are trying to sort of figure out how to make the institution play a role here and be um, be involved in the discussion. I, I will say, I think there's a lot of bilateral conversation that needs to go on here. Um, we are well aware of who our most trusted allies are. We are well aware of the countries with whom we share common values, um, some of whom we have trade agreements with, some of whom we don't. Um, and uh, and we know where our trade flows are. We know who we trade with. Um, so. Um, you know, I think that conversation, the conversations that Ryan and Sophie and I are talking about are, are hard to have the more people are in the room, honestly. Um, and a lot of that development is probably going to happen mostly on a bilateral or regional level. I'm regional, I mean USMCA, but bilateral, I'm talking more about big trading partners. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we also have to remember the genesis of the, the WTO was actually a small group and most trade policy gets made uh, bilaterally, then regionally, and then up the chain. So um, we have to bite off uh, small bites so we can eat a big meal. Um, so when it comes to the role of trusted partners, uh, which trusted partners uh, and, and when? So um, 
looking back to the analysis that I mentioned that we did with Boston Consulting Group, you know, it, it there were some things that were uh, no duh types of moments where the U.S. isn't going to have all the raw materials that it needs uh, in order to um, succeed in some technologies, even where it could succeed in other areas of the value chain. So I think we're all um, we're all familiar with the the need for um, critical materials and trade with Canada, but also Mexico, um, huge resources in Australia and Chile, a lot of countries where, you know, I'm naming now that where we do have uh, agreements uh, with partners. But I would also say, look, if we look at clean steel, there is a huge opportunity for U.S. manufacturing, so the operations and maintenance, um, uh, but probably not so much on the OEM. We're not going to be the ones that are, um, that are, uh, constructing and, and um, selling U.S. Uh, developers the furnaces or um, uh, anodes or cont container equipments. Um, that's going to be coming from uh, East Asian and uh, European partners. And as we've said, steel is a really important commodity for uh, national economic and security interests for most nations, um, and definitely so for the United States. So, you know, there are some really key priorities where we're not saying, overhaul everything and make the U.S. the electric arc furnace leader um, in, in the world, we're going to have to rely on partners to do that because it just doesn't make sense um, given our, um, our history on this, but also the specialization of, of others who we do work very well with and have for decades. So I think that's just one example of, you know, where we, even in a, an area where there is high national security element, we do still want to rely on trusted partners um, who we have a history of, of working with, but also maybe look to see that we have one or two, some, some duplication or redundancy um, of trading partners and opportunities. That that was a bad word, right? We're talking about um, the ideal is ultimate specialization, lean operations, um, you know, just in time delivery. And now I think what we need to be looking at given um, both uh, some very clear, you know, data-backed um, instances, but also world events that the public is paying attention to in terms of supply chain shortages, delays, um, that we need to reconsider some of our economic principles, um, and that includes, you know, trade, but also redundancy. Yeah, and Marina, I, would, I want to jump in on that just because I think I think you're referencing kind of Ryan, not just the trusted partners that we think of in terms of countries and international institutions, but you know I think also I spent a lot of time thinking about our suppliers and our our you know global network of more than eighty thousand suppliers, and you know you you I think are speaking to a concept that we all need to be thinking about, which is about resilience building. So how are we thinking about resiliency within the current um, economic context as well as the, the current context for climate? And what does that look like? Uh, how do we build um, and sort of sustain and foster those trade relationships um, with supply chains that, that are starting to build resiliency into their way of thinking, both for people and, and kind of planet um, and, and as well for our kind of business sustainability in the long term. So I think it's a really important concept to kind of connect on as we talk about the, um, the role for trusted partners. Absolutely, and we actually have a three R's, which are the different a different set of three R's, and you're used to hearing at Silverado that we use, we call it reliances, uh, re resilience, and redundancy, because they're all important. We have to think of, about this new different sort of economy. Um, in that vein, I wanted to maybe pivot back a little bit to uh, the brass tacks of, of, of the IRA. There's a tremendous amount of investment in the IRA and work being done in the government in terms of uh, permitting. Um, what types of, and uh, that permitting is certainly supposed to speed deployment of energy resources. Um, do we need an analog in the mining and processing world in order to meet that critical supply chain and have some of that redundancy? Well, I've never learned as much about mining as I now know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we um, we represent batteries, the battery storage industry, obviously uh, incredibly important that we have access to critical minerals if we're gonna build batteries in this country, which I believe we will. I think that's one of the most exciting timelines um, in the IRA is that we're gonna see a, a very robust development of battery manufacture, obviously EV leading the way. Car companies are way out in front on that, good for them. We're, we're trying to sort of follow on the energy storage side. but. Um, but I would say, yeah, this is, you know, learn, we need to think about whether, whether we're going to have mining in this country in a robust way, 
Um, we have had, uh, we historically were a country that did a lot of mining, then not so much in the last uh, 75 years or so. So um, that's something to think about. But I would also say to Ryan's point, if we have allies who are um, already invested in that space and are reliable and do it well, you know, you, you may not need to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, I would I would specifically call out the Canadians on this. I think it's been really impressive to watch their planning on strategic minerals here and thinking about what they are already mining, what they could be mining. Um, they're a country that has a robust history of mining and um, in a very, I think, safe way. And so um, I've watched very closely what the Canadians announced, what they're doing uh, in that sector, because I think that could be very helpful to us. And, and my companies are actively talking to Canadian suppliers. Fantastic. Go Canada. Um, so I have a couple of interesting questions uh, from the from the the, the group here. Uh, maybe I'll I'll lob this one to Sophie. Uh, the SEC ruling on GHG emissions is the SEC ruling on, on GHG emissions disclosure the right step towards transparency and disclosure engagement. Yeah, I appreciate that question because it's certainly top of mind for for um, most companies who would be would be eligible for the compliance there. I think it's a really good step. I would say there are a couple of qualifiers to that, which are that, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, it's gotta be workable, not just for a large company like International Paper, but for small and medium enterprises. Um, it's also gotta be kind of getting to Brian's point on data. It's gotta be leveraging data that everybody can get their hands on so that we have some sort of standardization and reporting. Um, and I think there's some challenges with that right now in terms of uh, what we think of as scope three, which is sort of all of the emissions upstream and downstream in our supply chains. Um, it's really important, I think, for, for international paper to, to um, better understand our emissions and think about what we're going to do to decarbonize, whether or not the um, SEC rule would, would sort of push us towards that within that scope three space is something that I think we're still um, a little bit concerned about, but I would say in general, I think that there's some really positive aspects of going in that direction. And um, you know, we'll will it remains to be seen what the final language will look like and um, how companies will be able to be in compliance with that. Um, so I think it was a, a step that certainly gave us an opportunity to say, hey, we're already doing a lot of great reporting in this space. How do we actually fit that into um, what the SEC is thinking and how can we kind of provide feedback that would make that more practical for, for most companies. Great. Ryan, did you have any thoughts? Uh, no, I think just to say that a lot of companies are, are moving in this direction anyway. And I think some of them who are moving faster than others might appreciate uh, some, uh, uh, I keep using the word harmonization, but some you know, standardization of, of what is required. Um, and I think as we see a lot of companies that are getting pushback uh, on ESG related issues and whether they are properly disclosing information you know, in the long run, having some type of standardized and government supported uh, mechanism uh, for reporting on things, including you know, your own company's risk level um, is going to um, uh, ultimately help insulate from a lot of those concerns that are coming from customers, large and small, um, uh, and that we're already seeing growing right now. Great point. Well, you certainly can't monetize things that you don't count. So the next question uh, is a good one. So do you think that the IRA and its incentive first approach has made any carbon has made any carbon pricing in the US less political politically feasible in the medium and long term? Um, you know, I would say as, as somebody who I think carbon pricing is, is going to ultimately be important, but I I actually really think that we've taken the right approach here in the United States by focusing first on the carrots um, and making sure that we are working on technology development and deployment, because what that's going to do is, you know, whether you're talking about if the stick is a carbon price or if the stick is um, a portfolio standard, what we're doing right now is lowering the cost of compliance or the cost of, you know, uh, of actually, um, you know, reducing or avoiding some of those payments that you would see in um, in a carbon pricing scheme. So, you know, I think that in in general, what the IRA is doing is going to make it more likely, more politically palatable um, to achieve that in the longer term. Thank you. 
Well, I would be remiss. I have a question here from um, the formidable Ron Lorenzen. And so um, when I first started my, my government career, uh, Ron was a big, a big muckety muck at the Commerce Department. So I cannot uh, see his name and not answer because I am a, an obedient bureaucrat at heart. Um, but Ron wants to know what the appetite is to continue these investments uh, with a uh, imminent potential recession, higher interest rates, uh, ballooning, ballooning deficits, and then competing interests for increased spending, such as confrontational, the confrontational geopolitical climate. So a really, you know, pithy and, and an easy question to answer. I will take that bait, Ron Lorenzen. Um, I think uh, the appetite is robust. And I would say that because what I'm learning from my industry um, partners here is that clean energy folks like the long term. They're, they're, they understand that there's risk. They understand that there are going to be bumps in the road, but they are committed to the mission and they structure their financing in many cases to be sort of longer term in terms of what they, how they really look at their outcomes. Um, it's, it's, they're brave folks. Um, and I'll give you a really good example, Ron, you will like this. Um, we have a lot of American energy companies invested in Mexico in clean energy. It's rough going down there. Um, but my companies are going to stay the course. They're very much behind the case that U.S. has brought against Mexico for violations of USMCA, but none of them are shutting down operations, even though it's been rough um, going. They're committed to a long term delivery of solutions for the Mexican economy. And I think that speaks really a, a lot about our industry and, and how we're willing to sort of see the longer term. And a lot of our financing, honestly, is structured that way so that it, it, it builds in a lot of risk buffering. Great, excellent response. Do other panelists have any views they would like to share? I mean, I would just add from, from my perspective, uh, growing trees is a long-term proposition and, and coming from a company that's 125 years old, um, I think that we are in this decarbonization journey for the long term. And as I said before, I think we're going to need all of the, the levers, the innovation, the scaling up. Uh, we need all, we got to be firing on all cylinders here because I think the only way that we kind of get there and then we get there together um, is through, you know, sticking through political cycles as well as uh, economic changes. And I think we've, we've sort of as a company proven that we're, we're going to be doing that regardless of what's happening in the world around us. And, and frankly, our customers and investor, investors and other stakeholders have spoken. I mean, they're, they're, this is, a, this is the, the delivering sustainable outcomes into, into helping shape a low carbon economy is the, the way of the future. So I don't think we see any possibility or interest in kind of going back from the path that we're on. And just to pick up on comments that Sophie and Brian have made, IRA is really impressive and it's money for innovation. I mean, if you really break it down and look at like the an amount of new in, like innovative technologies and test projects and DOE is out there trying to figure out what's the next best solar panel, what's the next best battery technology. I've learned in my industry that nothing is forever. We're, I tell people all the time, the solar panel on your roof in 10 years may not be the solar panel of today, just because we are moving forward. We're getting better at building better, more carbon low, efficient technologies and probably looking, you know, those of us today saying, looking at the landscape and looking at 10 years from now, we wouldn't really be able to even tell you what the leading tech is going to be in some of these areas because it's moving that fast. But um, but the, the hidden gem of IRA is all that money that's going into those projects that are not so visible maybe to, to, to everyday folks, but really an impressive amount of effort going into sort of trying to build that, that those new tech solutions. I think that is such an important point. And, you know, there's, there's money, um, that goes into you know demonstrating or deploying these technologies um, and that is going to be important but i think also maybe if we looked to chips and science and, and the science part which wasn't necessarily funded but there was a lot of uh emphasis and authorization of um basic r d um and into into demonstration um, but a lot of innovation at the earlier stages as well which is really where the United States is going to find it's, I wouldn't call, I don't know if it's durable, but it's kind of a repeating or um, kind of re-aiming of our target for advantage. The U.S. is never going to be able to win in a subsidy war um, or on, you know, uh, on cost for manufacturing or labor. Um, I think, you know, we're going to have to have some subsidies to bring us closer or close that gap a little bit, but where we're going to succeed is leapfrogging the technologies. That's where we're going to have to succeed if we are going to um, take uh, any lead or advantage in OEM, let's say in long duration energy storage, which is something that um, that we looked into in our analysis. 
um, because the, the costs are much, much lower um, in other parts of the world, but we're going to need to look for technologies that are using different inputs, different materials that are, have less reliance on rare earth minerals. And those are out there. We have some companies that are commercially operating, but that's where we're going to, to get our advantage. It's going to last as long as we um, can hang on to it in terms of our IP protection and also where we you know, freely want to trade that um, to folks and, and, and um, propagate that. But we're going to have to continue to plant those seeds. Um, you know, so LDES is one, but also electrolyzers in other parts of the world, maybe in China, are one tenth of the cost uh, as in the U.S. But we're going to succeed by advancing both in the technological scape, but also in quality. Um, so those are investments that are not quite as high dollar. And we're seeing, you know, it's not necessarily dropping multiple billions of dollars every year in its specific or, um, you know, sole industry. Um, but it is making sure that our innovation ecosystem is not just um, continuing to operate, but looking at new opportunities and, and where these, this industry is heading and with a, uh, a mind for competitiveness. Um, what is going to make us uh, or give the United States a stronger advantage and create new tools and technologies that are going to allow for greater deployment and faster deployment of clean energy? Great response. Now, the White House has been quick to mention that the, the IRA intends to lower the, the cost of energy for regular households, uh, cost of clean energy, uh, and also lower household uh, energy output, uh, and therefore the cost. Um, so either Ryan or Vanessa, or maybe, maybe even Sophie, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on that mechanism and, and how, how big of that, that impact is likely to be? So we saw in earlier estimates um, that, and I should say, they looked at earlier versions uh, of this legislation, like Build Back Better Act, um, that were showing an average of, let's say, $300 per year for the average uh, American household, and it varied by region. Um, and that would probably be revised down slightly, um, I think, just given some of the changes that were made in the legislation. Um, but I think that this is probably one of the biggest selling points and, and what I would if I were talking to somebody who had very low uh, uh, attention span for policy is to say, you know, to, to focus in on those cost savings, because if we're looking at lowering the cost of, uh, of renewables, either through technological development, greater deployment, um, transmission, which will enable greater deployment and lower cost, um, that is a real savings to, to power bills. Now, it might not happen this year or next year. Um, but also then when we talk about things that are maybe even more direct or more immediate, rebates on um, appliances, on weatherization, things that will save you money almost immediately, if not right away, um, there is some immense opportunity. Um, and I think that's just about getting consumer recognition of that. But we will be lowering costs, um, especially relative to trend lines of where we see them going. It's lowering costs and it's lowering the spikes that we see in prices. So just like, you know, December of 2020, December of 2021, a lot more Americans were understood or were using the term supply chain. I think a lot more Americans are understanding because of current events that are hitting them in the pocketbook that there is something to be said for reliability. And here, you know, again, talking about um, some, some dependable and even um, in some cases redundant opportunities um, and sources of energy, making sure we are investing in those is something that, that folks are going to find worthwhile um, and has translates to an economic benefit to them. Great. Well, we're, we're, we're nearing the end of the hour. So I have one closing question from the audience uh, before uh, Ken closes out. So I'm going to give you all a, a round robin chance to respond. But uh, we now uh, know so much more about the IRA and, and, and how its potential, potential for, for innovation in climate and economy. Um, what sort of innovations or, or best practices, be it the policies, standards, technology, knowledge, et cetera, from the IRA, do, we th do you think that the US needs to share with the world? That's tough. Um, it's tough because there are parts of the IRA that member <laughs> our allies are not happy about, right? Um, I, I guess what I, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I think that it represents um, a lot of what we've all been talking about, which is something that's robust, that's brave, um, that's that attacks, that's tech neutral. Honestly, that was a huge, um, I think, a huge benefit of the way the legislation.